Hello, I'm Fernando Guerra, Professor of Political Science and Chicano Studies at Loyola Marymount University. I'm also the director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. In addition, I am the host for the Urban Lecture Series, the program you are about to view. Here at Loyola Marymount University, we take pride in having our students engaged in the civic dialogue of Los Angeles. We send our students out to the community, but in addition, through this program, we bring the community to Loyola Marymount University. We hope you are informed by today's program. And for more information about Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and the Urban Lecture Series, please check out our website at lmu.edu backslash CSLA. Okay, welcome, welcome to Loyola, Loyola Marymount, Marymount University. University. Yeah, this, this is the, the Urban Lecture, Lecture Series sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Today we are going to talk about transportation and we have quite a few guests who've been involved in transportation for quite a bit of time and uh, are heavily involved in significant organizations that structure our transportation throughout the region. Um, I'm going to introduce them all and then uh, give a little context and then go down the line and ask some questions and then have uh, the usual give and take and then we'll have some questions from the students. Uh, right next to me is Lupe Valdez. She is Director of Public Policy and Community Affairs for the Union Pacific Railroad. In addition to working for Union Pacific, Ms. Valdez sits as the chair for USC School of Public Policy and Planning and Development and serves as a board member at the Commerce Industrial Council. Prior to working to, uh, for the Union Pacific, she worked as a public affairs administrator at Metrolink and before then as director of public affairs at the MTA or the LA County MTA. Uh, Ms. Ms. Valdez, Valdez received her B.A. in Psychology and her Master's, Master's in Public Administration from the University of Southern California. Um, next, next to her is Mayor Pro Tem Pam O'Connor. She is a Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Santa Monica. She is currently the Chair of the Board of Directors of the Los Angeles County uh, Metropolitan Authority. Um, this is an agency that all of you are very familiar with. It runs the buses, it runs the, a lot of the rail. She also she served on the board since 2001, representing the West Side and South Bay cities. And when we talk to her, we'll ask her how, as a member of the Santa Monica City Council, she then gets to represent the other cities, how that board works and the representation and where the 13 uh, members come from. Um, she also represents the City of Santa Monica on the Exposition Light Rail Construction Authority Board. And that board Board gets its money from the MTA, but it's planning and building the uh, Expo line, as we call it, uh, which is the only line that doesn't have a color. So we get a little confused about that. Uh, she's served as a member of the Regional Council of the Southern California Association of Governments, often known as SCAG, not GAG, but SCAG. And she's a member of the Local Government Commission Board of Directors. And she's also been uh, heavily involved with the um, uh, uh, League, of, League of Cities. And I can go on and on talking about all her awards from the American Planning Association, LA chapter, and uh, different uh, things that, that she's done. Um, Ms. O'Connor, or Mayor Pro Tem O'Connor, holds a master's degree in planning and in technology management from Eastern Michigan University and a uh, Bachelor of Science in Communications from Southern Illinois University. Uh, next to her is uh, Michael Kodama. And Michael is, uh, Mr. Kadama is currently the executive director of the Orange Line Development Authority. I never heard of it. And the only reason I ever heard of it is because I've known uh, Michael Godama for a long time and I got the notice when he got the job and I'm thinking, what, what is this? Did he make up this to get a job? Uh, so we're gonna ask him what the Orange Line Development Authority, which is headquartered in Paramount, California, is all about. He's also a president of uh, Michael Godama Planning uh, Consultants. He has worked on economic development, environmental, and land use issues. Um, I, I can I go, go on and on about the project, project that, that he's been involved in, in and, and uh, uh, since I've, I've, known, I've known him for over 15 years and he's always consistently involved in very significant planning projects. projects. Mr. Kadama has, has a Bachelor of Arts from the University, University of California, California at Los Angeles, Angeles also known as UCLA, UCLA in, in sociology and economics, economics, and a Master of Arts degree also from UCLA in urban planning with an emphasis of social policy analysis and transportation. 
Next to him is Ms. Hillary Norton, another person who I've known for a while. She's working for an organization called FAST, and that is an acronym for Fixing Angelinos Stuck in Traffic. I don't know if that's a doctor who gives you a sedative or what it could be. <laughs> She's, uh, her public service career began immediately upon graduation from Wesleyan College, and she did an internship with Tom Bradley, a work for city council member, now um, board of supervisor member, Mark Willie Thomas, who sits on the MTA board and also on that Expo Line board that uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem O'Connor sits on. And she also worked for State Senator uh, Gil Cedillo. Uh, she, uh, she earned a master's, master's in public, public policy from, from the Harvard Kennedy, Kennedy School of Government, of government. And, and she's also worked for uh, the, the Central, Central Cities, Cities Association. We'll ask what that's, that's a very significant organization that's, that's kind of a chamber, chamber of commerce in, in the downtown, downtown area. area. And, and she's, she's also, also worked for uh, the, the private sector, sector including Fleshman Hilliard, which is a public affairs firm. She worked as project manager for a significant development that is on hold called Las Lomas in the northern part of the city, very similar to what we talked about. Uh, um, about the Playa Vista and when we talked about NBC Universal, a project of that, of that dimension. Uh, Ms. Norton and FAST aims to create an inclusive coalition of business associations, labor unions, civic groups, neighborhood councils, educational institutions, elected officials, transit organizations, and residents like you in Los Angeles County for the purpose of implementing the findings of a RAND study and moving the city's more long-term transit initiatives forward. So it's, so it's a, a private, private kind of a nonprofit, but a lot of different, different organizations. organizations. Um, and, and we're, we're also going to have Ms. Rita Robinson, Robinson join us, who is the general manager of the LA Department, Department of Transportation, and I'll introduce her a little bit more when she gets here. She's, She's probably, probably stuck, stuck in traffic. <laughs> So um, we've entitled this uh, panel uh, Smart, Smart Growth. Growth, and I'm going to start with Lupe and go down the line. And I want to. Uh, this is the only time we really go straight down the line. And I'm asking you two questions. Number one, what is smart growth? And number two, what do you do? Um, what do you do at Union Pacific Railroad? What do you do at the MTA? And how are you trying to deal with uh, transportation issues? Uh, Lupe, smart growth. Yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk to all of you. Um, I'm going to start first with who I am, and then I'll lead into smart growth so you have an idea of why I say what I say. Um, I began actually my career in transportation, and that was not necessarily a plan. I was in a nonprofit agency, and I loved doing nonprofit work. A job came available at what was then called the Southern California Rapid Transit <laughs> District, called the RTD. My mother only used the RTD to get around on a bus because she did not drive, and um, she was scared of driving. So I got very used to being on buses when I was a kid. Uh, especially living in Lincoln Heights uh, in Los Angeles. That's how we traveled for the most part. We didn't have three or four cars. It was one car, my dad drove to work, my mother took the bus. So I was interested in transportation as a child because I was on it all the time. And then I got an opportunity to work for RTD and that started my career in transportation. But I really went there because it had good benefits and it had a, it had a very good salary at the time uh, coming out of college. So that was why I started there. But, but I also, it eventually became the MTA, and one of the things that I learned in my, in my process was I understood the planning, I understood the environmental work that needs to happen whenever you have any kind of project that receives federal or state funds, and then I saw the construction, let alone the operation of buses in a very congested area. So I really got a good sense of what was going on. Um, and I was able to see all that and see how much time it took, how much energy, and all the public processes that come with public, public meetings, community meetings, meetings, going out and doing stuff. stuff. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll talk, talk a little bit about, about that more later. later. Smart, Smart growth. growth. Um, sometimes, sometimes people tell me it's not possible. possible. Um, and and smart, SMART normally for all of us, we, we, we believe, believe it's something that we've thought through. through. It's, it's not, not something that just happens. happens. We, we have, have a plan for it. The challenge in Southern California is we are extremely huge. There is no other metropolitan area that I'm aware of in the United States that compares to the people, the, the amount, amount of people, people the amount of different cities, jurisdictions, counties that are in Southern California. California. So, so a plan, plan is kind of hard to do. do. We, we also have state laws here, uh, local, local regulations, regulations that, that kind of shape what we can or can't do in terms of policies, policies. Um, along um, with air quality problems that are always linked to transportation because we always push transportation projects to improve our air quality here in Southern California because we have a huge problem with air quality. But, but I think, I think looking, looking at smart, smart growth, what you're looking, looking at in a box, if I had a box, I would, I would put, put in that smart growth, growth the population, population. Uh, I, would I would put in there your geographic area, area. 
I would put in there what kinds of services you plan for your population, but also what kind of jobs are available. You in this room are extremely lucky. The general population in Southern California has never entered into a college classroom. Okay, that, that is very, very scary, scary for me, because, because while I know college is not for everyone, everyone you, you have, have to plan a community and a, have, have jobs available for that community, whether, whether you went to college or you didn't go to college. college. And, and that's, that's the, the economic, economic part of it. It, it also has to be a community that's sustainable, sustainable meaning that, that you can continue to pass it on to your children and your children's children. So I look at that as smart growth, that's kind of a capsule of what I look at, but it's a planned way to look, look at, at our, our communities, communities and, and to, to consider, consider all, all the elements, elements that go into the community. And that's, that's what, what I think of when you think of uh, smart growth. In the Union Pacific? At Union Pacific, I am now the director um, of public, public affairs, affairs and public, public policy. policy. I, deal I deal with everything <laughs> from my territory, just so you know, is um, Santa Barbara, the county of Santa Barbara, all the way to the Mexican border. And it's only me, I don't have an office of 20 people. So I travel a lot in that region. But what I focus on is um, issues Railroads in this country have not always been seen as community friendly. You and I probably have been stuck by a train or have heard a train horn in the middle of the night and probably don't appreciate that horn, don't understand why we have to blow our horn at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, don't know why I'm blocking your crossing, you're trying to get to the other side of the street. Um, that's normally the complaints that I receive, but what I do is I work with communities, local jurisdictions, on resolving issues and focusing and making sure they understand why we do what we do and understand what Union Pacific offers and what, what is involved in goods movement. So I work a lot with communities across um, Southern California in terms of any issues they may have with the railroads, particularly wherever my trains run. As my boss told me, our trains can't move to China. I am here to stay. Now, now how, how can, can I work, work better, better with communities, communities and local electeds, and that's what I need to do, is, is to work better to make sure we resolve issues because there are conflicts out there and there are challenges in a very congested world. Okay, uh, before we get Mayor Pro Tem uh, O'Connor to respond, let me uh, welcome and introduce Ms. Rita Robinson. She is currently the General Manager for the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. Uh, she also serves on the Board of Directors for the MTA, where Ms. O'Connor also serves on that board. Uh, prior to becoming the um, head of the uh, Department of Transportation, she was directed to the Department of Public Works, the Bureau of Sanitation. And before that, she also served as General Manager in the Department of the Housing Department for the City of Los Angeles. And so she is, uh, she probably should also serve on the fire department because that's her job. She goes out and puts out fires and, and fixes uh, uh, departments because she's also worked in the city administrative officers. She worked for the Department of Recreation and Parks. She's worked for the community development department. If there is anybody that knows Los Angeles city government, it's Ms. Rita Robinson who's been involved in the city for over 30 years and now is in charge of transportation. So things will always, they're gonna improve now that she's in charge, she guarantees it, okay? <laughs> um, Mayor Pro Tem O'Connor. Hello, everybody. So, how many of you have ever been to Santa Monica? Oh, come on. That's, oh, very, an, that's an easy I just want to make sure. How many of you have been to Los Angeles, downtown LA? Very good. So, we're working on getting the exposition light rail line that's going to connect downtown Santa Monica with downtown Los Angeles. Just want to put the pitch in there. And, again, having the upgrade transportation and transit that can take you up and down Lincoln Boulevard to connect with it if you're living down here near school. So, for me, I'm a, I'm a citizen legislator. It's not a full-time job when you're on the city council of most of the 88 cities in Los Angeles County. <clears throat> Big city LA, full-time job with a lot of staff. Smaller city like Santa Monica, we are elected to our council, we hire a city manager who then implements the policies set by the council, who then uh, implements the budgets that the city council makes the decisions on how to deploy the resources and the monies. But again, we set the policies, so then we're left with- How, how much do you get paid? Uh, we get paid about $700 a month. Oh. Right. And we meet on Tuesday evenings, uh, two to three times a month. So hey, it's better than, it used to be $50. So it was a little wow. bit of a bump up there. No, so no, that means- No wonder we have a budget deficit. <laughs> so it means you have a lot of other time on your hand. Although again, most of us as citizen legislators work at other jobs. So I do have a day job. My day job, I work in historic preservation planning throughout the Southern California area. I'm, I work with an architect firm and I'm, I'm um, a subcontractor to him. So that gives me the flexibility to fill in 
the rest of my day, because sometimes I end up doing my day job during the weekend, with things such as Metro, uh, which, I, which I truly love, uh, being on the Metro board and as well as being on the Southern California Association of Governments uh, Regional Council. And just to give you a little context uh, about the Metro board, it's a 13 person board. The five county supervisors sit on the board. The city of Los Angeles has a seat at the table with four positions. This is the mayor of Los Angeles sits on the board. The mayor selects one of the council members to sit on the board, and it, right now it's a he mayor, so he gets to select two other folks to sit on the board, and Ms. Robinson is one of the two others that he has selected right now. So again, city of Los Angeles, four seats on the board. Well, the well, rest, rest of the county, county the other 80, 80, 87, 87 other cities, they're, they're divided, divided into four, four geographic quadrants or sectors, sectors pretty equ equally based, based on population. population. And, and within, within each sector, the mayors, mayors of the cities in that sector, sector by a weighted, weighted vote based, based on their population, population select someone, someone to represent them at the Metro Board. board. And, and to, to qualify, qualify to run, you have to be a council member, mayor or council member for those cities. So I represent the South Bay cities, El Segundo, the beach cities, Palos Verdes Peninsula, as well as Inglewood, Gardena, all the way to Carson, the South Bay cities, and then the West Side cities. What's interesting about the, the South Bay cities is a little bit more typical in terms of their council of governments because they're all connected. They're, they touch each other. So West Side cities, though, which are Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Culver City, and, and West Hollywood, we're connected by Los Angeles. So Los Angeles is part of our Council of Governments, but I represent the four small, smaller cities at the Metro so Board. So if you were to lose your election, <laughs> right, or, city, or you decided not to lose, let me if I were not seated if you on the decided, council. If you decided right. not to run for re-election. Right. If, if I'm not a sitting council member, you could I could not qualify for this position, right, to be on the Metro and, Board. And in the quadrant, uh, um, what percent does, of the vote does Santa Monica get? The, are, they are they the, the largest, largest city? No, no. Actually, the, the way it works is that the South Bay cities probably has about 75% of the weighted vote. Mm -hmm. So it's skewed more to the South Bay cities than the West Side cities. So in a sense, you have to run for two elections. You have to run in Santa Monica to get elected. Then you have to run amongst the cities. But the cities vote, not the people. Right, not the, the mayors. The mayors of the cities vote. And again, they have a number of votes based on, on their size. So, yeah, yeah, so, so that, that, that's, that's yet, yet another, another election. And, and then, then to, to sit on the SCAG, SCAG, the Regional Council of SCAG, SCAG and that, that is, represents the sixth county area. area. There was called the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region, and, and that's, that's important because federal funds flow through the MPOs as they go down to the county transportation commissions. Uh, and that, uh, on that, there's about 70 of us who are, again, elected officials from throughout, and county supervisors and city council members from the sixth county area, uh, representing about 16 million people, the largest, the largest uh, MPO in, in the country. So I talked to some of my students and told them that there are four very significant regional organizations in Los Angeles. The MTA, SCAG, which we just mentioned, which does all the planning, the AQMD, which is the Air Quality Management District, and the MWD, the Metropolitan Water District. And of those four, you sit on two of those. Right, yes. Right? And there's nobody else that does that, is there? Um, or maybe all the council members from LA, because they automatically get a seat on the SCAG board. Right, however, they don't, I will say, they don't participate, but again, uh, they, they have, have a very, very different, different job than, than, than we do. They, they have, have committee meetings and council meetings during the day, so it's a little harder, harder for, for them, them to, to do that. Um, so, the Smart growth. growth. I know, I was going to say, there was one other thing. It will come back to me. Oh, sorry for interrupting you, but that's what I do. It'll come back to me. That's what he does. So, you know, for me, smart growth, when I think about it, it's about placemaking for me. When you think about it, what are those great places you've experienced in your, your life. life. You know, they, they could, could be, be whether, whether you're, you're on a trip, trip and you're visiting some, some grand space in Europe or some other country, country. Or, or it could, could be just, just you do have, maybe you live in a great place, place a great neighborhood, neighborhood where there's a park nearby, nearby the coffee shop, shop nearby, nearby, a bus stop, stop or a transit stop. stop. So, so how, how do you make, make those great places? And if you look at what are the attributes of what I think the great places of the world are, it's just not, it's the physical attributes clearly help. Architecture, architecture, the buildings, the trees, trees uh, 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 other, other attributes of public spaces, spaces but, but really, really it's it, it, those, those are arranged in a way, way sometimes, sometimes more considered and sometimes, and sometimes a little bit more spontaneous, spontaneous. but they, they draw, draw people, people, they bring people. people. It's, it's kind, kind of the, the theater, theater of the street, the theater, the theater of people, people. Places, places where people want to be. Santa Monica, we made a place like that, the Third Street Promenade. Uh, again, again, the concept that, that when you are working in urban planning and, and related fields, you start talking about complete neighborhoods and complete streets. And, and that, that has, has to do with, with again, 
having a great place where you have services, whether it is coffee shop, market. If you, you hopefully you live nearby, you have choices on how to get there. You can walk. It's walkable. You don't have to rely on using a car. You can take transit. You can take your bike. You have options. And you have connectivity to other places. Now, granted, in the Los Angeles and the greater metropolitan area, if, you want, if I want to go from Santa Monica to Pasadena, that's a tougher choice to make. You know, I mean, I probably have to do a car right now, maybe someday, with the light rail system, and you'll be able to do it. But there are a lot of places close and around Pasadena, and you know, their nucleus, and, and their, their uh, related towns, and around Santa Monica, throughout the area, where you can have that connectivity between these great places, these activity nodes. So again, as would be said, it's about placing and putting together and making sure they're interconnected, those aspects of life that, that are central to what you do in your daily, daily life, connecting jobs, connecting education, connecting services. And uh, the, again, the aesthetics and how it's put together, trees, those kinds of things really help define and make great places. I, I can get you to Santa Monica or Pasadena. You take the blue line to LAX, they take the green line, then you get on the blue line, then you get on the red line. No, not the red line. What's the one that goes to um, Pasadena? Gold line, excuse me, gold but line. Hopefully, gold hopefully. Line. How long would that take? I, I don't know, but. But with, with Measure R and, and the voters of Los Angeles, Angeles County in 2008, and it was a big turnout election because and two thirds of the voters had to vote to pass a sales tax, which was called Measure R, half cent sales tax. It's dedicated to transportation and transit projects. And what's going to be able to be built out of that? And the mayor of Los Angeles is working on uh, with us at MTA on a project to try to accelerate these 30 years worth of projects in a more, more compressed, compressed time frame, frame in 10 years, years um, would, would result in the Expo Light, Light Rail, which is under construction now from downtown Los Angeles to Santa Monica, the, the regional connector, connector by, by the way, already there is a Light Rail, as you mentioned, from downtown, from, from Union Station to Pasadena, also the blue line down to Long Beach, the green line down to El Segundo. But what's missing in terms of the light rail network, and there's also the metro subway, but the light rail network in downtown area of Los Angeles, there's nothing that connects them. So that regional connector to really make it a network and have that kind of connectivity. And if we can jumpstart that, if we can get that built, you will in a relatively short time frame. Um, by the time you guys are done with your first jobs and moving on to your next middle management or, or entrepreneurial position, you'll be able to do that. So you, you talked talk about placemaking, place excluding Santa Monica, Monica but, but looking at the rest of LA County, what's a place that, that works that you would like to see that you think is livable and smart growth? You have Larchmont Village, you have downtown LA is emerging too, you have a number of neighborhoods there. Think about, think, I don't know, you know, some of you may be newer to Los Angeles, some of you may have grown up here, and that, you know, you have different experiences, but, but when there were the, 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 1992, when there were the, the, some people call them riot, I don't know what the politically correct word is to say, but there was the, the racial disruption, disruptions, and uh, who's got the good word? Civil unrest, thank you. Yeah, see, I need you young folks to help me with those. Yeah, the, civil, the civil unrest. Um, and if you went down the Figueroa Corridor, you saw that it had, it had the framework of uh, what had been a neighborhood. It probably was at that point, maybe a little, you know, at the low, low point, but, but since then it's really come up. It's, it's just, just come up with an investment in the city, of USC I think is really staying there was important. And I've just seen in the last 20 years that corridor grow. You have LA Live, you know, I mean it's a different kind of place. This is more like a big city place, but still that's a vibrant emerging neighborhood. People starting to live down there. You have other pockets of downtown Los Angeles. You have Spring Street. Some of it's also focused around historic preservation when there are some historic buildings and notes like that. You have Pasadena. You have I, I don't, don't have, have enough, enough time, time to explore as much as, as I want to, to but, but I dare to say you could all come up with real vital areas in San Gabriel Valley, Monterey, Monterey Park, Park, where you have, have different ethnic uh, Chinese yeah. restaurants, Asian communities, you know, you know lots of places, places that have the framework, have a lot going on there, but right, right now maybe are a little more isolated. Mm -hmm. How can we connect them and how can those areas build on what they have to make them, flush them out more, make them more complete? Uh, this, uh, this is, is the, the Urban Lecture, lecture series, series at Loyola Marymount, Marymount University, University sponsored, sponsored by the Levy Center, Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Angeles. We're, We're talking about transportation, transportation smart growth, how to get around in the city and county of Los Angeles. Angeles. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mike, Mike Kadama, Kadama Executive, Executive Director, Director of the Orange Line, Line Development, Development Authority. Authority. What, what is, is that? 
Thank you very much. Um, the Orange Line, actually I have three jobs, but the first one, the Orange Line Development Authority is uh, a joint powers authority put together by 13 cities. It extends from south east Los Angeles County down East Rios, heads north into downtown LA, and then heads north again through Glendale, Burbank, up to Santa Clarita. The reason that this uh, group was formed, the JPA, has a lot to do with um, local representation, looking for transit solutions, having an option. So what ended up happening is the group of cities in the southern portion got together. They're part of a sub-region called the Gateway Cities Council of Governments and decided that, you know, no one's going to speak for them and say, this is the type of system that we want. We need to speak for ourselves. So when you hear about the construction of different rail projects, you're going to hear about different rail authorities, different construction authorities that are put together to push for projects to happen. Now, they're fortunate in that in the southern portion of this segment that I've talked about, they do have an existing right of way. It's called the West Santa Ana Branch. So it's just an old rail line that's not used very much, a lot of dirt and things like that on it. But they also have parts of it that go right behind homes. Uh, previously, before I got on board, they were pushing for a new concept of transportation called a magnetic levitation or maglev train. Basically, you take a train, you put on magnets, and you can push it along much, much faster than what you're able to do. Part of it with no, no wheels. No wheels. So like uh, Disneyland. Like Disneyland, right. Um, it is, they, they do have um, something in place right now that goes from, uh, in Shanghai, which is actually in use, that goes 200, 300 miles an hour. There's a proposal for another one that goes from Tokyo to Osaka at 300 miles an hour. Well, part of, let's see, if you went from the southeast cities to Santa Clarita at 300 miles an hour, you get there in five minutes. Yeah, well, part of the problem, though, is that we're in an urban area and we have stations. So we're re-looking at that, thinking about the different communities there, what best fits the community. And that is actually a process that we're undergoing now where there's a development study underway to look at those options. And where do you get your money from? The seed money actually came from the cities themselves. As members of JPA, they put up uh, a portion based on the amount of proposed track as well as population. And then they also um, have switched from a previous concept of totally privately funded to a public-private partnership. So right now you don't have any money in terms of construction. You have money in terms of planning and, and uh, really getting the message out in terms of what you guys want to do. Right, and as part of the process of planning here in, in the county, what they've done is they've used what's called Measure R funds as part of the long range transportation plan. And they've set their number one priority as the Orange Line. So they took their portion of that money, which is $240 million, as their startup funds for planning and getting the design going and things like that. So Measure R, you've heard it mentioned quite a bit. We also heard it mentioned quite a bit in, in previous panels. So you have to uh, keep your eye on that. Smart growth, what is that? Oh, smart growth. Well, smart growth is a number of things to me. But if I was going to kind of push it down to three sort of basic concepts, it's combining the idea of transportation, land use, and sustainability all together. Um, it used to be at one time that you'd look at open pieces of land way out there and say, hey, we're going to build out here and you keep expanding and keep moving on. There's a lot of opportunities and resources that we don't even look at or use, infill development, brownfields, even some communities that at one time were very vibrant and active that we've let decay. Smart growth is about taking advantage and, and using those resources that I think are available to us. In the transportation world, it's kind of interesting because some of the people will talk about we want to have density, we want to have rail transit, we want to have bus transit, but it's even more than that. One of the things that I do across the country is I work on parking issues. And how much parking you put in there is a critical component of transportation that oftentimes we don't even think of because someone else is paying for it. You mean like here at LMU, we don't charge students for parking? You don't get charged for parking? Nope. This is not UCLA. Oh, it's not USC either. <laughs> Well, the theory now is... Is that, is that a good thing, though? To have free parking? Yeah. Well, I look at it that someone's bearing the cost of your parking in your fees. So the other way to look at it is to pull that out and maybe give you some other options and have you pay less. Okay, next, next question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Hillary Norton, FAST, how long has this organization been about? Who's behind it? What are you guys trying to do? Okay, um, well, good evening. FAST is, has been around since December of 2008 only, and uh, it is a coordinated group of education, 
I've, I've given you a little bit of information about who our community partners are, but it was started because the chairman of our board, Jim Thomas, who has built a number of major, major projects in the city and frankly throughout the country, said he's, he's lived here for 40 years and he was just tired of being stuck in traffic, literally, and said, what can we do in the next three to five years? This was before Measure R was a gleam in anyone's eye. And in about 2006, he and Metro and the Music Center commissioned a RAND report of the best practices throughout the nation of what can be done within the next three to five years that have permanent results and they found that pricing was a big factor. So pricing parking, looking at high occupancy toll lanes, express lanes, looking at um, signal synchronization, I've, I've listed them, but really accomplishable projects and frankly ones that just require not only the uh, support of elected officials, but frankly, support from the community. And so what FAST is doing is going out to neighborhood organizations and communities and, um, and with our community partners, challenging people about whether or not they can truly get out of their cars and what would it take. And so it's been very exciting to look so what at- What do you, pull people over and you say, we want you out of the car? Or? No, actually, it's pretty interesting. When we go to neighborhood councils and people say, you know what, I, I live a mile away from the metro station but because it's downhill one way and uphill the other, if there was a tram that would take me or a, or a jitney that would take me back up the hill, I'd take the metro. I don't want to drive. It's costly, it's a pain, you're just storing your car, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these first mile, last mile solutions that we've been working with DOT on have been really quite exciting because there are people, not everyone likes to drive. And, um, oh, Lupe's mother doesn't like to drive. Right, right. And, and just the, the responsibility, the isolation, it's, and the expense is really adds up. And I think as we're going into this economy and looking at the downturn, knowing that the average car owner spends about $10,000 a year owning a car, the idea that you could put that back into your family's um, income is mm -hmm. pretty exciting. Now, um, you, you mentioned Mr. Thomas. I think to the students and to the audience, this is a very significant person who has been around LA for a long time, a major developer, has built some of the tallest and most significant buildings in downtown LA, but also in Orange County in different, in different areas. And so, it, and, and so this is a group of concerned citizens who got together and formed this organization. And uh, it's pretty um, significant. What's your metric for success? How do you know that you will be successful and how do you measure that? That's a very good point. Um, I think that on these top best practices, it's really seeing them actually put into place. And, and as luck would have it, you know, express lanes happen to come within the three to five year range of this project. And it is going to be the, the use of carpool lanes that you can pay to get into if you are a uh, single occupant vehicle, but you, by paying into it, you're, you're pricing congestion. And so this whole idea of congestion pricing, the city of Los Angeles has increased the cost of parking meters, so parking meters are freeing up, and so you don't have people you know, spending a lot of time circling the block like Santa Monica does, that they have shown people in parking garages where parking is available. So instead of tying up the parking lane and the next lane over from people circling the block trying to find a parking space, you can go park right away, park once, get out of your car and spend that time walking, shopping, interacting. It's, it's very exciting and, and again, very doable. Rita Robinson, General Manager of the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. She's in charge of the parking meters. She's in charge of all those people that give you tickets. Um, she's in charge of the signals. Um, she's, uh, um, it, it's, it's her fault. <laughs> so um, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? What did, you woke up today. Had, had breakfast. breakfast. What did what you do, do today? today? Give us a, a sense of what, what you did today. It wasn't a normal day. Mm. Okay, you probably, probably don't, don't want to know about today. No, we do. <laughs> that sounds even more interesting. <laughs> no, first of all, uh, I apologize for being a little late. I wish I could blame it on the traffic this time, but I couldn't. Um, but I did have to change from my firefighter uniform before I got here. Um, but um, on a normal, today was an MTA board day, so it was not a normal day. On that day, you pretty much put everything else aside because um, the MTA board meetings 
are quite serious. Um, we're dealing with serious issues in the community um, with regard to um, how we're going to spend the money that we have in Measure R, how we're going to develop the plan, what priorities we're going to have with regard to regional um, transit within the quarter, and as well as um, things as as, as well as things like the bus fare increase that was already built in. We delayed it last year and this year, and we had a number of, of people come to discuss the fact that they like a hearing about perhaps delaying that again. So on a typical day of board day, it's um, you know, all morning and most of the afternoon. Um, and then after that, there are all the other fires that have erupted while you were at the board meeting that um, you have to put out as well. So um, that was part of my day today. So, so have, have you ever, ever actually gone, gone out there and directed, directed traffic? I have not personally gone out and directed traffic. traffic. But I've, I've, I've certainly have a capable group of about 700 traffic officers who do a variety of things, not only with regard to citation issuance, which is important with regard to keeping safe straight streets, making sure business circulation happens. It's not just all about revenue. It's just about if we just were able to park anywhere we wanted to, anytime we wanted to, can you imagine the kind of chaos that would exist? Um, so, so part, part of, of, of having, having meters and part of why we met to have traffic move with regard to cars is, is, is the provision that traffic officers have. So no, I'm not going out, but that is part of what their job is also, is to provide traffic direction and control within the city as well. Yeah, I was just so thinking of that, that new TV series, Undercover Boss, and having you go out there and yeah. do something like that. Uh, well, I went on a lot of other undercover things. I, I think after I attempted to collect trash, I think they took me off of any undercover boss oh. series after that. Uh, you'd have to have some of my staff from sanitation tell you about that fiasco. And, and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, but I think it's called the ATSAC system that we have in the city the of LA. system. Can you describe that to the students, what that is, what the acronym stands for, and uh, how I have the staff that. explain the acronym because I don't know. Automated traffic control and surveillance system. Okay. Um, and really what ATSEC is is having a um, control system within the Department of Transportation that can watch the signalization of the city from across. And so when we talk about synchronized our lights, what we try to do is set up a situation. But if you're traveling the speed limit um, that you would have more green than red. It does not mean that you will not have red ever because that's what people really believe and they believe if they just speed down the street they should have all green. But it's a regulated system so that we can control the flow of traffic. And so we're advancing that system. The mayor was uh, very successful in going out to get state Prop 1B money um, of, of almost a billion dollars in order for us to, con to build out our system throughout the entire city and advance it so that we can have an upgraded system of track of surveillance throughout the city and signalization throughout the city. Um, I was actually very impressed. I got to go and visit that site several years ago and you have cameras and sensors and you see the cutouts in a lot of the streets where the, the um, as cars go by, the sensors pick it up and take it to this uh, room, which is a gigantic, it looks like an air traffic control room, where you have cameras of all the streets, not all the streets, what, how, what, how many miles do you know, or what percent? I mean, it's, it's a significant number. Now it'll be 100% by the time we finish the system in 2011. And uh, you have cameras everywhere. We have cameras everywhere, and we also connect with other camera systems, with Caltrans and other camera systems. Um, I think one of the ways that uh, we were able to look at this was when the Democratic National Convention was here in Los Angeles, and that was even before, um, you know, 9/11 and other things. But they were very concerned about how, you know, control and, and security within the city went. And this is one of the things. ATSAC was very instrumental in making sure that the city remained safe. We can move traffic and people through that system. Yeah. Well, what was cool about it is you could actually toggle the cameras and all that. And I was able to get the camera that's on Lincoln Boulevard and Jefferson and aim it over to LMU and right at this building and I could actually look right into Father Lawton's office. <laughs> I, I guess I, I shouldn't be saying that because that we're not supposed this to be able to do that. This was all before Google Earth as well. Right, before Google Earth. So, and he was just, he wasn't doing anything. So it's not like, uh, hey, he's not here anymore. I can say those things. Um, anyway, um, Rita, the, everybody loves to blame LA traffic but there's the, the concept of managing that traffic in terms of how demand management that we've been able to actually create greater capacity, 
then had we not taken all these kind of actions? Can you, and then maybe we can touch, and Mike, you can respond to in terms of what have been some of those uh, um, actions or policies or laws that we've taken where we really expanded the capacity of the system without building anything? Um, I think there's a few things. So I think you touched on uh, the idea of ADSAC and the idea of the computer and, and making and if possible for cars to move faster is one. I think also the other thing is the realization that it's no longer all about the cars. There's a change from measuring vehicles now to measuring person carrying capacity. So people walking or riding their bike or coming in and other modes other than cars are real important to mobility in the region. And I believe part of what smart growth is, is allowing people to have options other than a car in which to get around in the community with, or within the areas of which they like to spend their time, whether it's where you live, where you shop, where you go to school, having all of those other options as well as multimodal options, which is one of the things the city of Los Angeles is concentrating on. And you know, I know that people like to blame traffic. Uh, I mean, they always like to say Los Angeles just has the worst traffic in the world. And it always just never ceases to amaze me that we talk about it like it's some monster that fell up on the earth. It's, we're the traffic. Uh, when we, we are traffic. Every single one of us that drove today, every single one of us that gets in a car, we create the traffic. So it's not them or it, it's us. And so the way that we change that modem is to say that traffic can be controlled by us and it can be, it, we can do, make changes in our own lives that can impact lessening traffic. So if you take public transportation or your bicycle or you walk, God forbid, um, then that is one way that we can control traffic. So I think a lot of the reason why people voted for Measure R was just to have the dream one time in your lifetime, probably not in my lifetime, perhaps in terms of just getting started but making good decisions so that in your lifetime you will have more of those options not to create traffic. You can create other kinds of traffic where we just have multiple numbers, numbers of people, people walking, walking on, on the street, street that we will have to widen our sidewalks because we'll have more people walking there and we would have more bike lanes so we can have people biking there and i'm really very fortunate to have ken husting and jay kim here of my staff who are of, of your of your age bracket more or less um, that will be the new leaders in that vein of trying to create that environment for the future because by the time you have children as well I think, I think the environment of what we think is traffic of in, 19, in 2010 will be very different in the future. Um, and I think that's the exciting part that makes me get up every morning and face this job. Well, I voted for Measure R because I wanted more mass transit for my students to take, so then when I get on the freeway, there's less cars. <laughs> so, um, Hillary and then Pam? Yeah, I had a couple things to add. I, I've, I've handed out to you all um, a, a sheet on um, are that LA is the number one congested area in the nation and a little bit of why and what's happening on our freeways, but also how good the choices that we can make away from a single car can be and how time saving they are. And um, I had a carpool today and just by being able to take the carpool lanes on the 110 to the 105, we left at 410, left downtown Los Angeles at 410 and got here at 440. Being able to make just a couple of changes into high occupancy vehicles, using our roads better, we were whizzing by all of the people who chose to stay in those same modes of a single car, wasting their time, and in fact, part of the reason that the, the traffic demand management can work is that people really want time back in their life to be parents, to, be, to get another job, to go to school, they want time back in their life, not sitting in traffic, and yet we waste 490 million hours in Los Angeles stuck in traffic and $10 billion every year due to uh, traffic delay. So it's it, imperative for everybody, it's imperative for our economy, and it's imperative for our quality of life to do something about it. And you can make a choice starting now. Pam? Well, that's the conundrum that we, we all face, and that we want, when we want to go from A to B, we want to go fast. Well, let's, let's say we want to go from A to C, we, we want to go fast. fast. But when, when we're, we're at home living at B, we, we don't, don't want those cars speeding by. by. So, so how do we figure out which are the high capacity, capacity high flow streets, streets that, that can carry it? it? And are those are the ones to where you apply the, the, the congestion, congestion pricing, pricing to in terms of corridors. You want to 
manage that. that. You want to yeah, yeah, yeah. maximize, optimize, get, get the speeds uh, up so, so that people can travel the distances. distances. What are those, those other streets, streets though? Where they're, they're, they're part, part of the community. community. They're, they're they're going, going to connect, connect different, different cities, cities together in centers, centers, but they're, they're not, not going, going to be the high speed ones. They're going to be ones that do their job. And, and one, one of the things, things that, 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 you know, in, know, in terms, terms of shaping, shaping the cities we have now, now there's something, something called the California Environmental, Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. And, and CEQA, you, you do environmental review when, when projects are in, in different cities and counties. And, counties. and, and one, one interesting thing, thing I find about CEQA is the way that it's been applied, again, was groundbreaking legislation in 1970, right after the National Environmental Quality Act, NEPA Protection Act. It has to do, in terms of how it's, measuring air quality, uh, how many cars get through an intersection? And those cars are cars occupied by one person. Well, if there's backup, it's called level of service. If the level of service is degraded, if those cars are not getting through the intersection, then you mitigate. And the mitigations have all been aimed at getting cars through intersections. So what have we designed for the last 30, 40 years? Widen the street, narrow the sidewalk. We also, we also say, say oh, oh my gosh, gosh that, that bus movement, movement is causing the, the, the street to degrade. degrade. That, that bus movement, as you know, which, which is actually carrying more people through the intersection, though, is perhaps being losing its, its ability because the street is designed to get redesigned to move single occupant vehicles through. And gosh golly, what's causing the cars to slow down? The people walking. And this is just another aside thing, as you all know. If, if we, we want, want to build, build healthy, healthy communities, communities, we want active, active communities, we want, we want more people walking, we want more people biking, those, those are going, going to impede the traffic movements of the single occupant vehicle. vehicle. So, so we, we have to move away as a sequel from, from measuring just how many cars, cars get through an intersection, but how many people are getting through, whether it's by car, whether it's by bike, whether it's by transit. And again, that has had a real impact on how we built the communities recently. And if you have a Bigger, bigger street, street it's going to be harder, harder to cross. cross. You know, you're, you're going, going to start, start segregating, segregating uses, and, and you're, you're getting, getting away from, from the concept of smart growth that, that we've talked, talked about, about, getting, getting away from, from what a neighborhood looked like at, at the beginning of the 20th century, century where, because, because you were more limited, limited because you didn't, every family might have only had one car, you didn't have multiple cars, so you had to have services near you, and the market helped feed that, and that helped form and create, I think, stronger communities than what we have now in terms of placemaking. This, this is, is the, the Urban, Urban Lecture, Lecture Series, Series at Loyola Marymount University, University sponsored, sponsored by the Levy Center, Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Angeles. We're, We're talking about, about transportation. transportation. And of and course, transportation doesn't only include people. It includes uh, uh, goods uh, and movements, uh, uh, good uh, movements. Uh, uh, Los, Los Angeles, Angeles the, the, the custom area for Los Angeles, has over 40%, I've heard, over 40% of everything that comes into the United States, not California or LA, but everything, 40% of all the goods that come into the United States come into the Los Angeles Custom District first, which is our ports, Long Beach and Los Angeles, our airport, and even across, across the border. Okay, so we have to move these goods through Los Angeles, out of Los Angeles, the rest of the country, and we compete with people and pedestrians and everything else that we were talking about. What, what's the status of goods movement in Los Angeles County? I think it's an interesting question because it is challenging, and I'll tell you why. When you and I go to the store, Let's say, Let's say we go, go to Target. Target. Let's, Let's say, say my, my favorite, favorite Costco, Costco, Home Depot. This is, not, this is a non-commercial time. Non-commercial time. <laughs> but I have to name stores that are out there that all of us go to. A grocery store. When we get something, if it's a fruit, if it's a vegetable, it normally may come, may come with a little tag that says what country it came from if it's not the United States. Uh, same when we buy a product. It may say where it was manufactured. Um, we, we just, just know, know it was manufactured, manufactured there. there. We, we do not, not always take into account how it got there. there. And I'm, I'm going, going, on, I'm I'm going, going not just beyond the farm worker, worker that picked the fruit, that picked the lettuce. The lettuce. I'm, I'm going, going also to how the, the physical item got, got to that store. store. There, there is normally a truck, a train involved in that process, okay? So while we have a huge market here in Southern California, we are the gateway to the United States because we have what in Los Angeles, Port, of LA, LA and Port, and Port of Long, Long Beach, Beach is considered a deep water port, port meaning, meaning the, the vessels, vessels that come in can be seven stories below the surface of the sea. I mean, they have seven stories deep and seven stories on top because we have a deep water port, meaning these huge ships can come into the port and unload and then get distributed not only to Southern California, but to other parts of the country. 
So all of that is part of the network. In addition to that, what you also have is you have a great need here for people that want products and services that come by way of, of boats, by way of ships throughout the country, okay? In addition to that, I was just in Washington last week meeting actually with the Maritime Commission. The Los Angeles Chamber hosted what's called Access DC, where a number of us, there was about 200 of us, went back to talk about the issues of Southern California. And the Maritime Commission told us that one of the things the Obama administration wants is to increase exports from this country. That is an incredible goal, and it's an important goal, to export what we produce here to other countries. The challenge is you have to have the infrastructure. If it's a highway, if it's a train track, whatever that infrastructure is to physically move the goods. We are able to move normally a mile long train, even though I apologize for all of you that have ever been stuck by a train. Normally a mile long train, double stacked, is the equivalent of about 270 trucks. Okay, I understand the impacts at a crossing, but I will be honest with you, in terms of environmentally friendly issues, I want to move those goods, if they're moving out of the Southern California area, I want to move them on train because I can move them more efficiently that way. So that's some of the challenges. The other challenge we face, so, is we're crowded. We are congested physically, not just with our roads uh, for trucks, but also with where we live. It used to be, I mean, when you see movies, you say, you know, someone lives on the other side of the tracks. Only in California do we have million dollar homes next to railroad tracks. I mean, we have some expensive homes next to areas where in many movies, they say the other side of the tracks was a bad thing. It's normally very expensive real estate in California. And so how do we live together when I have an operation, goods movement is 24 seven in my world, where there's a residential community living next to it. I also am required, and I tell you all this because a lot of people don't understand it. I get calls all the time, and I, I was at Metrolink before, so believe me, these calls are not just to freight movement, it's to passenger. People would call me and seriously tell me, you know, I know that engineer is blowing that horn because he's upset because he's awake at three o'clock in the morning and he wants to make sure everyone else is awake because, you know, that's the only reason why he's blowing that horn. I cannot tell you how many times people have told me that. Why is he blowing that horn? He is blowing that horn because there are laws in place and for an engineer, the only defense he has to avoid a collision or not kill someone is that horn. That's the only thing the engineer has. People do silly things, unfortunately, around railroads. He's like a Toyota, he doesn't have a brake or what? He, he has a brake, he has a brake, but when he brakes, it's gonna stop 100, 100 yards, 200 yards away. He's not gonna stop like you and I in a car when we hit the brakes. He's gonna hit the brakes, but he's gonna hit that person and that vehicle or that animal first before he stops. So people don't understand that sometimes, and that's the only device he has to warn someone in front of them that they're doing something dangerous, they need to move. But he is also required by law to blow that crossing if there's no one there. And he gets fined. I don't get fined, the company doesn't get, he gets fined. A lot of money. He doesn't blow that horn when he's coming to a crosswalk, even though he can see. He can see everything. There's no one there, it's two in the morning, he still has to blow that horn. Now, now there's, there's a law, law federal, federal law, law that, that, that allows communities to ask for quiet zones, meaning that the local, local jurisdictions take on the responsibility of, um, of us not, not blowing our horn. Not, not a lot of cities have done that because obviously that's a liability issue and that hasn't been challenged in court yet. But it's, they're not blowing their horns because they want to wake you up and they're upset because they're awake. I mean, that, that is their requirement by law. Believe me, they do not enjoy blowing their horn is something that's required by law. So. Are there she locomotives? There are she. I, 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 I should say there are both men and women. They're both men and women. We're, a little, we're getting there. We're getting there in, the, in a railroad industry that was predominantly male oriented. It's now a lot more female. Well, no, listen, um, women in transportation are very significant. We had a tough time finding a male, so uh, Mike is our, Mike, he's our token right now. So we, it's, we don't really think he's that qualified, but we brought him over just to be able to have representation. So, um, you know, we talk about all kinds of letters. Uh, every time you put two or three letters together, you come up with a government, MTA, MWD, AQMD, SCAG. Uh, there's also ACTA, the Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority. What is that? It cost us $2 billion. Right, I can take that. One of the things that was created, um, and I was somewhat involved in it, because at the time I was actually with LA County Transportation Commission, 
in the, in the, in the area that goes from the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach to downtown LA. What you had, and, and this comes over years and years, California normally used to have a number of different railroads. We had about, I want to say five at one point. We now have two class one railroads. Those are the, the long haul folks. Those are the folks that go across the country. Those are not the folks that stay local. They go across the country carrying goods and services. But what was left over in the South Bay were all these twists and turns of rail yards that drove communities nuts, basically. Because a train could come east-west, then another train could come north-south, and those communities had to live with this every day. The Alameda Corridor, what it did was incredible, because it was the first in the country to consolidate these rail lines, put them below the surface of the street, so two things the rails got. They got to increase our capacity and they got to increase our fluidity. The two most important things for a railroad is they don't want to be stuck. They don't want to be stopped. That makes them no money. That makes us no money. We need to move goods quickly, okay? And that Alameda Corridor allowed for that. Now, what's happening now is anyone who uses it, and that's what the interesting mechanism was that I thought was fascinating from a public-private partnership, we pay to use it. And that's how they're paying for the construction costs over 20 years. So all of us that use that corridor pay a fee to use it, um, and that is what's paying back the money that was, that, that was used to fund that project, because it is expensive. Anytime you go below the surface of the street, it's a very expensive undertaking. Oh, basically, it's a subway for freight trains. It's a subway for freight. And it allows for traffic on top of that to be able to cross and trains, for the most part, not to stop folks going east-west, north-south, traveling on all the local streets. And the, and the two ports, the port of uh, Long Beach and the port of uh, LA, uh -huh. both supported and, uh, and, in a sense, loaned the money uh, through bonds to finance it, and now it's being paid back in terms of the way we use it. But it only goes from the ports in San Pedro to about downtown, right? And then, but then we still have to get, uh, what happens after that? Right, the corridor that's going east, and there's been many elected officials that have said, why couldn't we continue it? Um, and again, in today's times, economies, public dollars are not that readily available. What you have is now another group called the Alameda Corridor East, and they are very focused on getting, um, coordinating and working with local cities in the San Gabriel Valley, but now also in other counties, San Bernardino and Riverside, um, to work with local jurisdictions that want to grade separate, meaning you want to pull the street over the tracks or under the tracks, okay? That's, That's what's called, called grade separations. separations. Unfortunately, those projects are expensive. They are not cheap undertakings, and a city normally by themselves cannot do it. They can do it in a collaborative effort when they get federal, state, and money from the railroads to do that. So that is what's happening now with Alameda Corridor East. Um, the other thing you have to think about is building a trench in today's economy is very challenging because it's extremely expensive. And, and so, so you look, look at these opportunities to do great separations, separations as a way that, that you can influence the traffic patterns, make them better, uh, allow for emergency vehicles to go over or under and not be impeded by train traffic, and you look at, at that across the board, and that's what's happening now. And we know that the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles kind of paid or backstopped the Alameda Corridor. Where would the money or that same type of support come for the Alameda Corridor East? Who, who would do that? The MTA? Um, right now, Alameda Quarter East has a number of funds. They have, they have successfully, um, if any of you have ever traveled in the city of Alhambra on Valley Boulevard, if any of you have ever been in San Gabriel Valley, there is a portion of the track that actually was trenched many, many years ago by Southern Pacific. Southern Pacific was a um, train company that was based actually in San Francisco, California, and uh, was merged with Union Pacific in the mid-90s. And what, what they, they did was they, they trenched uh, a railroad, railroad track. track. These uh, Alameda, Alameda Quarter, Quarter East folks are now looking at extending that. They are looking, uh, they, they have gotten, gotten state funds, funds and they're looking at federal funds, funds to help defray the costs because, because that continued trenching through the city of San Gabriel, if any of you have visited the San Gabriel Mission, would probably take care of four grade crossings. That project is the equivalent of four grade crossings. So that, those monies uh, are, are competitive. It's hard to get them. It's not easy. We're, we're, I mean, Alameda Quarter costs us $2.1 billion. In today's world, we're talking $3 billion. We're, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a lot of money. So I'm gonna go down the line here, start with uh, Rita uh, Robinson and come back. If there was one reform 
not you know not uh, cars that fly or stuff like that but if there was one practical reform that could be implemented sometime in the next two or three years and not taking politics into it because that's always the political will assuming that there was the political will what reform would do you think you would would you like to see that's a great question especially trying to take politics out of it that would be amazing I mean, that in itself might be fantasy land. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, I mean, not to mention the fact that half of us are bipolar as well. Um, I, I, would, I would think, I think a willingness would be the thing I would like to see, a willingness for change. But you know what, I mean, it, it, how much does the MTA um, use for marketing? Because there was an article in the newspaper, in the business section, I forget whether it was two or three days ago, by a columnist who I actually enjoy reading, Lazarus, I forget his first name. Um, he also, he, he's the one that substitutes for Pat Morrison in, in, uh, on KPCC. A great guy, I typically enjoy his stuff, but I thought that article was horrendous in, in the sense that he talked about how difficult it was to get around in mass transit. You know, and, and from, from my perspective, perspective when, when, when I, I take, take a look, look at, 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 at the people, people who use mass, mass transit, transit, they know they how to use it very effectively. effectively. And, and especially people, people who are transit dependent, they, they, they could tell you right, right away. away. Like, like your, your mother, mother could, could tell you exactly where to get. And, and so this highly educated columnist couldn't figure out the system. And he wrote about it. A lot of people read about it and he did more harm and now the, the millions of dollars that the MTA spends to try to educate people about how to use the system was basically that column cost the MTA, I would say, millions, millions, of, millions of dollars. Um, and, and then every day, uh, whether you're watching March Madness or um, I forget what, uh, what tournament uh, Loyola Marymount was. I never heard of that tournament until, no, it wasn't, no, it wasn't even the NIT. <laughs> CIT. Okay, what's that for? The goal line? Oh, was it California? California? California. Okay. I think it was Catholic, Catholic universities in Southern California. California. That's how we got into it. Um, kidding. We, we had a great year. Um, every time on March Madness or any TV, you see the car companies spend billions of dollars telling us to drive. And especially in California, it's not that nobody walks in LA, it's that nobody's walking in LA. It's you have to have a car. And, and, and so, so there's this whole culture. culture. How do we how do we overcome? What are the reforms that we can that we can deal with, Hillary? What do you, what do you think? If I had all the money in the world, um, it well, you would, wouldn't be here, here right now. Right. Right. <laughs> it would be actually to repave our thoroughfares. Pam O'Connor was absolutely right that we need to change the hierarchy of streets, get residential streets to be residential, but to take our thoroughfares repave them appropriately so buses can travel on them, bikes can travel on them, and cars can travel on them safely, and, and then signal synchronize. So when you say repave or redraw the lines? No, 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 I mean right now, all the potholes, all of the, the street degradation right now, it, it doesn't even take redrawing the lines, it just take parking off during, during rush hour, and use what we've got. Don't expand the width of the streets. Just repave them so every lane is usable. And that, you know, as someone who does ride her bike downtown, every pothole is way treacherous. And you have to ride in the middle of the roadway instead of on the side of the street. So that is a reform that actually can be instituted in the next two, uh, two or th three years. And we could get more and more people on our streets and instead of speeding down residential streets to go from clogged thoroughfare to clogged thoroughfare, use the thoroughfares as the way of traveling quickly, the residential streets as a way of, of relaxed and, and harmonious travel, and, and make more throughput on the streets by getting rapid buses, bikes, and cars and high occupancy vehicles like vans and others to be able to share streets instead of swerve okay. like they're doing now. Mike? Well, I think if, if I would say one, one thing that we can do right now is I'd like, like us to redo how we do transportation funding. Um, we're fortunate here in the county that there's a lot of leadership. We have Measure R, we have Proposition A, 
we have Proposition C. But These are, are all ballot measures where, where the voters decided to tax themselves and the money goes directly to transportation. Right. But at the federal level, we're still set getting the same amount of dollars per gallon that we did in 1993. There's been no cost inflation, nothing linked to the consumer price index. So what happens now is as people move into public transportation and mass transportation, they're actually taxing, the, they're actually putting more burden on the system, but there's no resources to expand the public transit system for them. And I think the other part of the equation right now is if you want to study transportation and take a look at the big, thick book at the federal level, there's 108 different funding categories. Not one of them, though, is for goods movement yet. And I think they need to take those funding categories and consolidate them and make them easier for people to understand and make it so that communities that need the funding, such as this one here, can compete for it. Pam? You know, I don't think you can get away from political, because even, even what color to name a line. Oh, that was, it, was tell, it was very controversial in terms of uh, uh, most of the lines we've named them. We started off with the blue line, we've had the red line, the gold line, and then we came to the expo line, and we're supposed to, what color was it supposed to be? The gray line? Or the, oh, aqua line? Right. Oh, going, going to the ocean. Aquaman would take it. Right. right. <laughs> Although USC, there was some, you know, rose colored. Oh, Cardinal. Or Rose Cardinal. 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 Right. UCLA. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but if, if there, there were, were one thing, thing. <laughs> yeah. right. that's, that's in your blue. Right. Uh, uh, one, one thing, thing uh, I, I think pricing. pricing. Uh, truly really pricing. pricing. We, don't we don't pay the real the price, price of parking. parking. We, we need to price parking. You know, we. Okay, well, explain this to me. What do you mean? When I go park, someone charges me, I'm paying the price. What does that mean? We're not paying the real price. Well, Donald Trump of UCLA has written books about it and, uh, you know, in, in it, about it, and a lot of folks are talking about it. Just in pricing, the concept of the pilot study program that's going to go into effect if there's one lane on the 110 and the 10 that will be through transponder and you're paying a fee, you'd be able to drive through that in a single occupant vehicle for a fee and it would guarantee you a certain... Oh, is that what we call the, the Lexus lane? Well, we're going to, yeah, there a certain, certain level of um, speed you would get. get. And, and right, some call it the Lexus lane, lane but then, then again, again, folks, um, of, you know, maybe that's, that's somebody, somebody regardless of their, their economic status. status. You're right, right. somebody who's rich may decide they use it all the time. Somebody, somebody who's a little poor may say, hey, because people are making trade-offs and cost decisions every day, as all of you are making those decisions, that today I need to take it because it will be worth it for me to take it. And there's also, if you're a small business, if you're a mother where, uh, if you pick up your child late, there would be a fee for that that would be greater than using and paying for that faster transit transportation mode, and also mechanisms for people who qualify uh, means tested to help, help them defray the cost of, of using it. But people would give people an option that if they, that they wanted, wanted to pay or could pay, pay would move faster. faster. But, but how do we, we charge, charge people now? Because right now, people do not pay the real cost of driving. driving. Yes, 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 you pay for your gas. gas. Yes, yes, you pay to maintain your car. car. But, but cities really subsidize uh, a lot, lot of public, public parking, parking, the roads, etc. Et so, so I think we need to look at pricing, congestion pricing, pricing of parking, and just reform that. And then people will start looking at now, Ms. Mr. Lazarus may have said that the system was hard to use, but if he was making a real economic decision, I bet he'd learn faster exactly. how to use it. Exactly. Lupe, what do you think? What would, what would be in your magic wand? What would you, uh, what would you do? I will say in the magic wand, and I, I, I will tell you this from the public sector and now me being in the private sector. Uh, one of the things I've learned is some of the things that don't work, guess what? They don't work for either group. Um, and as Pam mentioned, we have a very stringent California Environmental Quality Act process in terms of environmental review and process. To me, it's kind of crazy that if we get federal funds, we also have to do the NEPA process, which in many cases is probably 85 to 90 percent the same document with a different cover that says NEPA, okay? One is state, one is federal. I, I get a lot of student papers like that. Where there was, <laughs> anyway, go ahead. But, but this, this issue is important, important because, because if you're, you're talking about streamlining, if you're trying to make more efficient, efficient at, at the very minimal, minimal I am wasting another uh, whole ream of paper on these documents that could be six, 800 pages in length, and, and it's, it's basically, basically a lot of the same information. information. There's, There's probably, probably some, some, some piece that, that isn't, isn't, but the majority of the document, document they both serve the same purpose. purpose. If, if there was a way that the federal government could recognize a stringent rule that California already has 
for these projects. I mean, these projects, just doing these, this process takes 18 months to two years just to do the process. And I mean, you could really streamline that process and, not, and, and still spend the money, but do it so that the federal government would would acknowledge our CEQA process as meeting their requirement so that we could also get federal funds for these projects that have gone, gone through this as opposed to paying a consultant to do a, another document which basically tells you 85 to 90 percent of the same thing. I do want to mention something that, that, that uh, having worked at Metrolink, um, Metrolink stations, if any of you have been on them, and these are the stations that go from Riverside, Orange County, um, Santa Clarita, Palmdale, Lancaster, as well as Ventura. These stations don't have people. And when you get to the station, you know, people don't like to look stupid. Let's face it, okay? So here I am dressed in a suit and I'm looking at this machine saying, what do I do here? I mean, it, it, it says I accept credit cards, it says, but I, how do I know what station I'm going to? One of the things Disney did, and I have to give them a plug for this, is when they had a whole group of ABC executives that were coming from New York to relocate to Burbank, they ended up doing a buddy system where they, where they had someone physically go to that person's home and go ride with them to show them the ropes, to show them how to get on the train, to show them where to park, uh, to show them what the process was and when they got to Union Station, how to transfer over to another, to another um, train to get to Burbank or to get to Glendale or to get to wherever they were going. But it's taking that fear of the unknown away and it's a fear of not wanting to look stupid to be quite frank in many cases because you're looking at this machine and there's a whole line of people waiting for you and you're still reading, okay, I have to put my, I have to press this button. And it's the society we live in, but I think that's a part uh, that we miss sometimes is that interaction, that human concept of just teaching people and then they can teach others. Okay. You should, we could do a YouTube, a YouTube, here's how you take metronome. Okay, this is time where students can come up and ask any of the questions. You can t give your traffic horror story or tell uh, a Ms. Robinson where you want a stop sign changed or, uh, uh, you know, where, or Ms. Pam O'Connor in Santa Monica where you want the blue bus to stop, etc. You know what's fascinating is, so I do welcome you to come up here and ask a, a question, is that none of you in asking you what you would do, none of you talked about construction. No one talked about finishing the 710 freeway. No one, no one talked about, about building, building, which I've never understood. Maybe somebody knows the history of the 90 freeway, which goes two miles to nowhere. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the strangest thing right here. We, we take it all the time, time but we're, we're not, not going, going anywhere. anywhere. <laughs> it's, uh, um, so, um, so while students line up to ask questions and get extra credit points, um, <clears throat> I, 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 got a, I got a wish list that, that I would, so if I could snap my fingers, I want you to, uh, I want uh, Ms. Robinson to kind of react to this. There are a lot of streets that travel east-west and they're parallel. I think we ought to turn one of them going one way, all of them going one way, and one of them going the other way. And for instance, like maybe Pico and Olympic. That seems like such an easy thing to do. Why don't we do that? Oh, I, you know, I don't know how you would have thought of that one. I don't know, just came up with those two. It's just, it's just a miracle. Um, yeah, could have that, been any other two streets, but I just randomly chose those two. <laughs> that was the reason why my wish was that we had some willfulness to do things, because I think that that is exactly where we are, is that, you know, the city of Los Angeles, as well as many of the regional cities that we're working with, have looked at um, new ideas for how we could do one way, or, or we call, you know, preferred directional, um, type, type streets, streets in the city of Los Angeles, Angeles and we're currently we're working, working on the idea of Pico Olympic, Olympic in doing a sequel document and an environmental impact, impact review of what they okay, would so you can't just, I mean, you're, you're the head of the, of the Department of Transportation. Of Transportation. Can you get these two guys and you and, and Mike, Mike and I will go and help too? Well, Can we just happened. turn the signs over? Well, what's, what's, I mean, but that's what happened with the mayor and a couple of council people and we got sued. That's exactly what they did. They, uh, they wanted to, what we wanted to do was pilot the idea and the local businesses, you know, sued us for not doing an environmental impact review of how that would impact the community, the parking, and everything else in that situation. So do so, we know, uh, do we have studies that show that if we were to turn those into one ways that there would be greater capacity and more flow? But that was what we wanted to test in the pilot program. That's, that's exactly what we wanted to see, and then we wanted to grow that idea further once we got but the pros and the cons were of that idea. And actually, Ken Husting is working on that environmental impact review, and we'll shortly be out with the results of that. But just as, as we were talking about on the panel is that the amount of time, 18 months to two years, and money, 
money, uh, maybe a half million dollars, and much, many times more, cut into the amount of money that we would have to do a full project, as well as the amount of time when you add the mitigations and others. We're working on this on the Wilshire bus only lane. Uh, this is where we want to have repay. We want to repay most of Wilshire Boulevard, if going back to Hillary's idea, as well as do uh, preferred busways on Wilshire Boulevard to increase the delivery of people across Wilshire. This would be the precursor to the subway to the sea in a way. Uh, to, to move, move people. people. So, so these, these, are, these are some things, things that, that we are actually doing, doing and we're in the middle of that environmental impact, impact review as well. That, that will be out next month. month. So, so many, many of you will get a chance to track the actual progress of these projects actually being vetted in the communities. And that's what I mean about making, having willfulness and being able to make good decisions with the money we have now to impact the future. Yeah. You know, a couple of students, students line up here, but Pam, I wanted to ask you something about leadership and, and the MTA. And there's been a lot of discussion uh, about term limits and how it's heavily impacted the, the, the number of, um, the institutional memory that every four years we kick people out or every six in the assembly, et cetera. But the MTA has been really consistent. I mean, Mark Antonovich has been on there since 1980. You've been on there since 1990. Fasana, excuse me, 2001. Fasana has been there for, it seems like forever. Um, the only real change sometimes is just the city of LA representation, but most of it is pretty stable. This is stable leadership. Um, why, Why do, do we, we sometimes, sometimes get disappointed in terms of the results of, the, of, of traffic policy, transportation policy? I don't know that I can answer that, but, but one, one thing about, about term, term limits, limits just one, one comparison, comparison, well, I can, I can be, be on the board, board a little bit longer because we don't have term limits in Santa Monica, but certainly the city of Los Angeles has term limits. And when I compare that to my hometown, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, where they don't have term limits, and you have a mayor who has been elected, probably think he's on his fifth term. And frankly, for him, well, I think they get elected for life there. I mean, right, there's so. mayor. No, but seriously, it, it took and, him. And if you die in Chicago, you can keep voting. So right. it's a weird, weird. But it took him the kinds of changes he made to the physical infrastructure of the city and the ability to do that could, didn't really happen until the third term. You, you know, you, you have, have to get, get some, some traction, traction going. going. You, you have, have to build both, both the support, support etc. Hard, hard to do that in eight years. years. So, so first, first of all, the major city that we, that um, we the, the four million, million city, city of Los, Los Angeles, Angeles with the term limits, limits I, think I think that really does uh, pose some, some, some um, problems. Uh, 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 but over, over, over the, the, the years, years really it's my years being in Southern California and just being alive, there's People, People expect, expect accountability, accountability from, from government. government. But, but right, right now, now we really have the opportunity because of the technology, because of the internet, because of the way people communicate and get information to be able as an agency to communicate back to folks about what's happening, to be accountable. And I think that's one of the key things coming, that's going to come out of Measure R. I mean, Measure R is providing the funding for projects, but there's that accountability to the public, the promise that was made about how these monies were going to be expended, trying to do it as um, efficiently, effectively, and try to accelerate it. And right now, through the, through the web, you can get on to the Metro website. You can get on to the Measure R page. You'll be able to track today, tomorrow, next week, going forward, how those monies, how those are being spent, how those projects are moving forward. And I think um, that will, will just also help to engage folks and, and keep us all working to achieve ends. Yeah, I mean, you can get on the website and get real live traffic updates and what's, ha what's happening. That's pretty remarkable. Uh, this is the Urban Lecture Series at Loyola Marymount University, sponsored by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Um, gentlemen, identify yourself. Uh, my name is Robert Lopez. I'm an econ major. Hoping for some uh, extra credit from Dr. Guerra over there. <laughs> and, okay. And so your, your favorite, favorite professor, professor again? Uh, oh, you mentioned already. Go ahead. <laughs> no. So um, you got this is essentially for the entire panel. Um, and Dr. Guerra, I know you'll probably chime in. Um, it's essentially <laughs> my course. You, you guys are really, really gung ho about this whole Measure R, and it passed, and it's extremely expensive, and it. Uh, I personally, I feel kind of. Um, didn't, didn't take, take everybody into consideration, but I want to know, know why aren't you people looking at buses, which are more popular than trains here in Los Angeles, um, are easier to reroute, are cheaper to maintain, and can cost the city a lot less money, as opposed to these trains that go from one specific area to another and are paid for by a tax 
that was paid for by everyone in Los Angeles, but is primarily going to benefit people on the west side with the trains. Okay, well, let's get, let's, let's get uh, Mayor Pro Tem Pam O'Connor mentioned. The basic idea is we spend billions on rail, but yet buses are the ones that really carry more, a lot more people and are a lot more flexible. 20 years ago in Los Angeles, there was no Big Skyway. I mean, there had been earlier in the 20th century, but it's in the last 20 years that the light rail network has been built. The light rail network now goes down to Long Beach. That's not the west side. It goes down to the South Bay. It goes to Pasadena. So right now, projects that are under construction today at Metro actually um, authorized funding for the Gold Line to go further east from Pasadena, east into San Gabriel Valley. But the biggest hole has been the west side. There's no fixed rail transit to the west side. Expo is what's under construction now. Um, and, um, and then, then the, the possibility of the subway, of the subway being extended to the west side. side. What, what it has, has to do with is what's, what's the best, best fit for what corridor? corridor? There's, There's not, not going to be a subway on many streets, streets along many corridors, corridors probably, probably only a few Wilshire, Wilshire, in, Wilshire, Wilshire Boulevard, Boulevard which runs from downtown Los Angeles to Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Um, and Santa Monica Boulevard up in West Hollywood. If you look at the ridership in those corridors, they can support a heavy rail subway that, that would, would move more, more people, people than you can with buses, buses going every minute down, down that corridor. Then, then you, you have, have the other, other network of the light rail. Light, light rail can carry more people. people. So you, you have, have that spine, spine you, you have, have that, that network, network of rail. And, and that, that, as you will point out, has to be complemented and supplemented by a strong bus system. system. And, and the, the bus system, system has a hierarchy of buses, from rapid buses that go down major corridors that use technology such as transponders to hold the green light longer to let the bus get through that intersection to facilitate its movement to the, the traditional express bus, bus that stops, stops uh, has, has fewer stops, stops to local buses. buses. And then and at, at the, the municipal level, there are sub-regionally municipal, municipal governments, governments like Santa Monica, Gardena, Gardena Culver, Culver City operate their, their buses, buses that feed into that system. system. And, and smaller cities, cities Redondo Beach, a uh, number, number of cities, cities West Hollywood, Los, Los Angeles, Angeles DOT has the DASH bus system in neighborhoods, are circulator buses that feed into it. So you need that network of transportation options. And, and buses, buses are a major, major part of it, but buses, buses alone, you, 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 you could, could get, get, as we said, you could get from Santa Monica to Pasadena on a bus. That, that will never be viable for most people because that, that would take a very long time. time. Light, Light rail will make that, that trip easier. Hi, I'm Hanif, I'm an econ major. And I kind of have a two-part question. Ms. Robinson, you mentioned how traffic is caused by people and it's not like a machine or anything, it's caused by individuals. And I wanted to know, with all the, the policy discussions and decision making that is going that are that, that's, that's taking place regarding transportation, how important is communications in in the policies in, with with dealing with the, the general population? And I want to know how does the city and the county and, and all the transportation agencies how, what is their interaction now with like Google and and other um, big communication firms? Well, that's, that's a great, great question, question, and I, I think, think it's an important, important one because part of what we're, we're experiencing when we talk, talk about smart growth or any of the measures that we've been able to pass is the communication with the community and trying to find out exactly what kinds of things you and the community are interested in having as part of its growth and of transportation and how do we solve some of the problems and needs that you have in your communities. And, and I, I think, think that, that conversation, conversation happens not, not only on the political level, because of course you have the city council or the board of supervisors or even the MTA board, but it's happening down at the level of the communities themselves. When we go out, um, um, Ken is working on the, HL, on the 405 widening project, which is a Caltrans project being managed by the MTA in conjunction with LADOT and all the, the other agencies that need to be connected to make sure that, that um, HOV lane is built on the 405 freeway. This, these are our state and federal dollars going into this project. And so it's all, right, all the way down to the community level where we're talking to communities about the impact of the construction as well as no, those, those communities understanding what is going to happen. And it's happening all over the city with regard to all the rail projects all of the all of the improvements that we're trying to make are communicated by the communities through not only their representatives in the led, uh, in the city council or the board of Pup, or on the board of supervisors but even throughout the representatives at the congress and the national level 
Uh, so we have a lot of interest with regard to how do we solve the problem of congestion within the city of Los Angeles, but not only within the city, but within the, re within the region. And you ask about technology and Google and some of the other um, ways that technology can be used, and we're learning more and more about how that interaction in a larger scale by having websites and interactive websites that allow it, it, many of you to participate in the discussion. Even when we have EIR or Environmental Impact Review um, release and we need to get comments back on you looking at how those projects impact your community, that's not just by coming to a hearing or having to sit through a long city council meeting or a long MTA meeting. You can interact by even going on the website and being able to send your comments to us that are taking place. Even on the city's bike plan that we're putting out now, the city of Los Angeles has a new bike plan that is, being, is going to be launched in the next few weeks. We've had interactive response from, the, from many of you who have said we want bike lanes here or we don't like the path or we think it should be this direction, those are the ways we're using communication in order to hear from the greater public as well. And other members might want to speak to this. Hillary? I wanted to say that one of the reasons that FAST was created was actually that to expand the stakeholders for a various projects. So for example, Olympic West Pico East has been controversial in the local area, and yet you're all stakeholders. If you need to travel around this town, you're all stakeholders in that project. And so we're trying to focus on the fact that everybody has a role to play. You all have an important role to play right now in the fact that you are all traveling these roads. So also, I would listen to the idea that go on these websites, work, look at our website at FAST. You have a lot to say about these projects happening, and they're going to make a huge impact on your future and the economy that you're going to get to participate in. See yourself as a stakeholder for every single one of these projects, and that's why Measure R and its transparency is so important. You are going to be using this, and so you need to be participating because the people who are going to say no, they are organized, they participate often, and they don't, not enough is heard from the people who say yes, who think yes, but don't say it, actually. Mike? Just a, I have a question for all of you to kind of think about. Um, do any of you guys go to a location because no one's there? Is that something that you plan for? Say, I'm going to go to this restaurant, no one ever goes there. Now, am I going to go to the sporting event because no one ever goes there? I mean, all of you agree. But the reason I ask that question is, is, is part of it is, is that when I look at it, is, is traffic always bad? And, and I will maintain that's not always true. Is congestion, is congestion always bad? And I don't, I don't think, think that's, that's true. true. Sometimes that means that you're all going to a place where everyone wants to go to, and that's part of going to be your experience. You're going to have to wait a little bit. And that's part of what happens with the roads. If you want to drive at 3 in the morning, hey, knock yourself out. I bet you get anywhere you want. But, you know, you're all driving at the same time, so that impacts what you're doing. The other part of it is maybe we get away from this idea of always talking about traffic or congestion, but really talk about mobility and access. And, but, but also, also for, for us in transportation, transportation being efficient in how we develop systems. And I think those are some things that I would like to see more of. And, you know, as you think about those thoughts, think about are you able to get to places and can you get to the places you want to go to when you want to? Scott, I'll, no, go ahead. Hey, and the good congestion in Santa Monica, you know, Friday night, there wasn't congestion around Third Street Promenade. I'd be worried. People wouldn't want to come there. So that's the good congestion. Well, that's and, what know, happened to Westwood, you know, years ago. Yeah. You know, say having a bustling, vital area is because there are services and places people want to be. That draws people. So there's that magnetism, that, that energy. And there's always going to be some congestion with that. Yeah. Um, Lupe Valdez of the Union Pacific, Pam O'Connor, Mayor Pro Tem of Santa Monica, member of the MTA Board, Mike Adama, Executive Director of the Orange Line Development Authority and Consultant Par Excellence, Hillary Norton, Executive Director of FAST, which is Fixing Angelino Stuck in Traffic, and Rita Robinson, General Manager of the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it.